Hello again, and welcome to another online training session with the Baselight Learning Program. This week, I'm going to be covering curses. Curses in Baselight is quite a large subject, so this is actually just the first part of two sessions on curses. We'll cover the second session at a later date. Today, we'll be looking at the settings for the cursors and how they work in the Baselight timeline. So let's get started. The cursor feeds the image display with pictures from the timeline. You could consider a cursor as being like the playhead on a tape machine, which plays back images as the tape passes it. In Baselight, the cursor is shown as a pale blue line in the timeline. At the top, where it reaches the time ruler, there's a handle which shows you the current timeline position. The default is to show frames and time code, but this can be changed if I go to the scene settings menu. In the general page, um, where we have the time units setting, uh, at the moment you can see it's set to frames and time code, but if I only wanted to see the time code in the timeline, I can turn off the frames. And you'll notice that that's not just affected the cursor, but it's affected all of the time units along the whole timeline. Um, we've got some other options here as well. Um, an interesting one is time code in frames. If I enable that, you'll see that that's actually the timeline time code, but expressed as a number of frames from time code 0000, which is midnight time code. Anyway, I'll set this back to the, the default, which is the frames and time code setting. Now you'll also notice that there's a little number one at the top of this cursor indicating that this is cursor number one. And that's because Baselight can have multiple cursors. In fact, Baselight supports up to nine cursors, uh, which can be very useful for doing things like comparing different shots. And we'll be covering the use of multiple cursors in a separate session on cursors at a later date. You'll also notice that the cursor appears as a blue line in the thumbnail and the cuts view. And again, we've got the cursor number at the top there. And obviously when I hit the space bar or press the play button, the cursor will play along the scene. And as it passes along the frames, we see those frames in the image display. I can also drag the cursor using the mouse. And you'll notice that when I get towards the edge of the screen, the cursor doesn't actually go all the way up to the edge. It stops and then the, the timeline starts to scroll in the opposite direction. And similarly, at the other end of the timeline, it does the same. Now this region here is known as the scroll region, and we can actually adjust that. If I want to change that, um, I can go to Preferences, and in Preferences, in the Timeline section, uh, under Navigation, uh, where is it? Navigation. Um, this setting here, the Timeline Scroll region, you can see that currently it's set to 25. That means 25% of the width is going to be used for scrolling. Now, I can reduce that, uh, but I can't actually set it all the way down to zero because we need to have some space here um, at the edge at either end of the timeline. But look what happens when I set it to 100. Now, you'll notice that it's put the position, the cursor right in the middle of the timeline. And now if I try just dragging it along, you'll see that the cursor doesn't actually move and what happens is the timeline moves in the opposite direction to the direction that I'm dragging the mouse, which might seem a little bit weird, but when I press play it'll be more obvious. Um, now what's happening obviously is the, the cursor is staying in the middle and this is more like the playhead on a tape machine or a telecine and the, uh, the media is moving past it um, behind. Anyway. Some people like working that way. I prefer to actually be able to drag the cursor along the timeline, so I'm actually going to set that back to its default setting um, of 25%. So we can now drag it up to the edges of the timeline. Now, cursors in Baselight um, are actually composed of two cursors. We have the, the vertical cursor, which of course is the, the time cursor, but we also have a horizontal cursor which is this blue line along the bottom here. And we call that the row cursor. 
Now, just as the time cursor is determining which frame in the timeline to show you, the row cursor is determining which particular point in the stack, in the base light stack, to show you in the image display. And we can move the row cursor up and down using the up and down arrows on the keyboard. So as I move it up, you'll see the image change as we step through each of the strips in the stack. Now some of these strips, uh, for example this one is a shape, it's being used for the vignette strip below it, and if I carry on further up towards the top, that's a tracker strip, and then the very top is, is obviously the raw uh, input image. Um, so this is one way of seeing how a stack is built up just simply by moving the row cursor up and down. Now, if you want to skip over the map layers, so you, you're not inter interested in seeing shapes and keys, uh, you can use the page up and page down buttons. And that will basically just step from one layer to the next, skipping over the, uh, the layer mats. Um, there are corresponding buttons on the control panels, on the blackboard and slate control panels that allow you to step up and down individual strips or uh, stepping up and down layers. Also, if you've got um, multiple stacks, for example, above this stack, if you have another one, either another version or maybe this is a, a composite, um, then you can step up and down between the stacks by holding down the Windows key or the Control key on a Mac and using page up and page down. That's an easy way of quickly stepping up and down between stacks on top of each other. Now there are several settings associated with the cursor and they are accessed from the cursor's view. Now the cursor's view is, is normally visible in most workspaces because it's quite a useful view um, and it's, it's here in my particular workspace but if the cursor's view isn't currently visible for you, you can open it from the views menu, um, views cursors. There isn't actually a keyboard shortcut for that. So I'm going to just move it over a little bit so you can see more clearly what's on the buttons. And I'm going to go through uh, the settings and explain what each one does. So first of all, at the top of the cursor's view here, um, you can see there's a button that says Cursor 1. That's because currently we're working with Cursor 1. So if we go through the settings, and remember that these settings are specifically for Cursor 1, um, the first setting here is the viewing format. And this is the format that actually is being fed from the cursor into the display. And by default, the viewing format matches the working format of the scene. So by default, uh, you will end up uh, you, with your image display being fed with the same format as your timeline, which is, which is kind of how you would expect things to work. But you may want to change the viewing format um, so that you can actually see a different format from your timeline. For example, let's say we were asked to do a deliverable, which is uh, maybe a lower resolution, maybe a 720p deliverable, and we want to see what that's, what that's actually going to look like, how much we're actually going to uh, lose in terms of resolution, and maybe there are some keys or other parts of the image which might actually be affected slightly by the drop in resolution. So it's useful to be able to preview what it's going to look like. And we can do that very easily by clicking on the Viewing Format button, and we now have a list of all the formats which are available to this scene. In other words, formats for which there's a mapping in this scene. Now, uh, we're going to cover formats in a lot more detail in a separate tutorial, um, but just to give you an example, let's say uh, we want to see what it would look like at 720. If I click on this, now at this zoom level you're, you're not really going to see much difference, but if I zoom in a bit and find something uh, with a little bit of detail, Now at 720p you can see there are quite coarse pixels here. If I switch this back to the default, the, the timeline resolution which is 1920 by 1080 then obviously the pixels are finer. Um, and as I said if we were pulling a key off this particular edge then that might make a difference in the way the key works. So it's useful to be able to preview things with a different uh, viewing format. There are other reasons why you may want to do that but as I said we'll cover those in the session on formats. So the next setting is resolution and this actually refers to proxy resolutions. Now we don't really use proxies very much in Baselight these days um, but sometimes you may have a particular format where you're working on a medium resolution proxy of a very high resolution material. 
And if you wanted to see what the medium version looked like, then you could select it from this list. And there's also a low resolution version, but obviously for my format here, it doesn't matter which I select. We're just going to see the same because all three of these have the same resolution. If I click on the thumbnail, obviously this is a much, much lower resolution proxy, then clearly we get a, a very low resolution image here. Um, so I'll just leave that set to high, which would be the setting that most people would use. The button next to that, uh, which says optimized, is used to control the way that the image is decoded. Now this doesn't apply to all types of uh, sequence, um, but if your input sequence uh, is raw or a compressed format, then depending on the decoder that's being used, um, it can be set into different modes. Now by default, we configure the decoder um, in what we call optimized mode. Now this will try and use a half resolution decode um, to speed things up if it's not going to degrade the image too much. And also certain uh, decoders uh, also have a higher speed, a lower quality uh, decoding algorithm, which may also be used. So Baselight will optimize the decoding performance to give you a, it's a trade-off between the quality um, and the speed. Now optimized is the default, but if you actually want to see what the image is going to look like decoded at the full resolution and the full quality, then you can switch this to max quality. But obviously, in some cases, this may slow down the playback uh, considerably, um, especially if you're working with very high resolution material. Um, there's also a lower option, uh, which is called draft. And that might be useful if you're working on a very low powered machine and you're not too concerned about the quality that you see during playback. Maybe you're, you're just doing a quick uh, dailies review, um, in which case you could switch this to draft and it'll, it'll speed up the playback performance in, in many cases. Anyway, I'll leave that set back to optimized, uh, which is the default. And then the third setting here, which is the viewing color space. Um, this, as the name implies, is the color space that is being sent to the viewer. In other words, the color space of the image display. And uh, we've already covered this in the session on color spaces. Um, and if you haven't uh, watched the, the, session, uh, the video, then I, I recommend that you, you go and watch that now. Um, but basically, the viewing color space uh, should always match the color space of the display device that you're using to view the scene. Uh, in my case, I'm using a, uh, an image display which is inside my desktop, inside my computer monitor. And my computer monitor is a standard sRGB display, so I've got it set to sRGB 2.2 gamma rec 709. But if you're working on an SDI display, um, you may want to set that to REC 1886, REC 709, or maybe P3. Um, or if you're working on an HDR display, then you would want to choose the appropriate HDR color space from here. Okay, now uh, there are several other options. Now, the next option that um, we, I'm actually just going to hide this one for now. The next option, which is visible by default, um, is this one here, which says layer number. And you can see that that corresponds to the current layer number in the timeline. And in fact, if I move the row cursor up and down, you can see that that number changes. And that's because not only uh, is the cursor showing us the output of the stack at that particular point, but it's actually also selecting that strip. And you'll notice that as I move it up and down, the parameters are changing as well because the strip's automatically being selected. And this layer number here, because it's grayed out, is indicating the fact that it's automatically selecting that layer. Now we're going to come on to strip selection in a minute, uh, but that's uh, basically what that is showing you. And the overlays button next to that, um, well, that turns on and off overlays on the display. Now, overlays are things like the outlines of shapes. Um, for example, if I move up to that shape strip here, um, you can see that we can, uh, obviously we can see the shape we can manipulate it by clicking on the outline. Um, however, if I turn off overlays, then we can't see that and therefore we can't manipulate it. Um, now that's obviously useful if you want to see the image without the overlays getting in the way, um, so like a clean image. But 
Um, you need to make sure that that is switched on, especially when you create a new shape, because otherwise um, you, you'll create a shape and you won't be able to see the controls. So make sure that the if you can't see the shape um, and you think you should be able to, then just come into the cursor settings and just check that overlays hasn't been turned off. Okay, now there are several other settings for the cursors and I'm going to um, add those by clicking on this drop down list here. And rather than uh, add each one individually, I'm just going to add them all. And I will go through them all, although some of them um, we're not going to spend much time on. Um, first of all, the mask. Now, by default, there is no mask applied to the image display here. If I click on the mask drop down, you can see that we have a list of masks that we can use. Uh, for example, if I wanted to view this with a 235 or a 239 mask, I can turn that on, although I think this image is already pretty much at that. So let's uh, instead, let's choose um, a title safe mask. And you can see that that's now masked off everything outside the, the title safe area. Um, now, while the mask is applied, um, I can actually zoom the image so we only see the masked area. Or alternatively, I can turn the mask from being opaque into transparent. So I can see the bits of the image that have been masked off. Um, now the next option here, the guide, also uses those same masks. Now you may be wondering where these masks have come from, and they are actually part of the current viewing format definition. In fact, if I were to choose a different viewing format, maybe this uh, film 2K film format, you'll see that we now have a different set of masks. Um, that's because they're dependent on the currently selected viewing format. And again, we'll be covering masks as part of the session on formats. So I'll just switch that back to the title safe mask. Actually, I'll switch that to the action safe mask and we'll use the guide to show us the title safe area. So that's showing us a title safe area within our HD 1920x1080 viewing format. Um, and then the third one of these three settings here, oh, there's, a, there's an option to turn on a crosshair so you can accurately see the center of the image. Uh, the third one of these settings here is a graticule which allows us to specify a rectangular area in the center of the screen and this is quite useful for lining up uh, things like captions um, and you can adjust the height according to these sliders set it to a certain uh, XY value here. Um, okay so I'm going to turn off all three of those now um, I'll just set this back to no mask, no guide, and I'll turn off the graticule. So the next option is true light, and this allows you to apply a true light profile or a LUT to the cursor output. Um, now this is only really used in specific workflows uh, where you do need to apply some form of uh, emulation LUT on the display output. Um, so we're not going to go into that detail into detail about that now, um, but we'll cover that uh, in the more advanced session on cursors at a later date. The next option is to show counters. If I enable the counters, uh, you can see that we now have a couple of time codes shown. Um, R standing for the record time code and S being the shot time code. And there are other counters that we can overlay on the image. Uh, if I click on the counters button here, you can see the options that we have available. Uh, for example, if I want to see the original file time code, I can click on this here, uh, which actually matches the shot time code. If there was separate audio time code, I could click on this button here and you would see the audio time code and so on. And there, there are um, various, uh, various other options that we can overlay on the image. Now it's worth pointing out that these are just used in the display. Um, they would appear obviously on an SDI output, but they aren't going to appear in any uh, files that we render. In fact, none of the settings here um, in the cursor setting actually have any effect on your final rendered deliverables. These are, as the name implies, just settings for the cursor, um, not for the rendered output. Um, 
if you uh, if you were to go to the render view, you will find that the rendering uh, the render settings, uh, some of them are similar, so we can apply them to the uh, to the render. For example, if we view with a mask, then we may also want to render with the same mask. However, counters cannot be rendered; um, they are only available as an output uh, on the display. Um, now, a quick way of turning on and off counters is using the keyboard shortcut K and that just simply toggles on and off all the selected counters. And if I press and hold K, after a brief pause, you can see that a series of numbers come up and there are other counters are visible. Um, and this allows us to quickly toggle on and off uh, other counters. For example, if I want to toggle off that file timecode, I can just press 3 while I'm still holding down K. And if I want to turn on the um, uh, the clip name, which is 6, I can turn that one on here. And now when I let go of K, you can see those ones are now visible. And if I just do that one more time, if I hold down K, um, while they're in this, in this uh, mode, we can also click and drag to reposition uh, any of these time codes. Um, so that's the, the counters setting, and I'm going to turn that off now. And the next option here is to um, allow us to view burn-ins. Now again, the burn-ins available will be determined by the current viewing format. So again, if I were to go back and choose a different format, for example this format, the film format, um, you'll see that there are actually no burn-ins defined for this format. Um, so I'll just go back to the default HD format. And if I just turn on we have two sets of burn-ins defined for this particular format, data dailies and film dailies. Um, so let me just turn on the data dailies and you can see that this uh, is actually a, a preview of what the burn-in would be if we were to enable this um, in the rendering option. Now obviously this would be quite useful when you're doing a, a dailies workflow. You may want to render your graded dailies to a file where you've included some of the uh, metadata uh, burnt in. Now, again, um, we're not going to go through the setting of the actual burn-in because that's part of the format, so that'll be covered in a separate tutorial. But you can interactively edit the burn-in by enabling edit here. And if I wanted to add another element, for example, if I right-click on the screen here, I, I could just add the date. And, for example, that would now allow us to burn in the, the current date um, so we could tell when the file was rendered for example. Um, okay I'm going to turn off the um, burn-ins and we'll just move down to the next setting. So the next setting which is called rendering. Now don't let the, the name rendering confuse you as I said already all the settings in here only affect the cursor output. They don't affect the output that's in the final deliverable that we would render to a file. So this is uh, this is the rendering to the cursor and it's determining what is actually rendered to the cursor. Now the options here by default you can see that it's set to to row cursor and that setting um, is why when we move the cursor up and down the stack what we actually see is the stack rendered up to the point of the row cursor. Now there are other options in there, for example if we wanted to view the mat for a particular layer. If I enable uh, layer mat, now these layers don't have a mat but when I get to this layer here, even though I've not moved the row cursor to the shape, it's actually showing me the shape for this layer and similarly this layer here we can see there's a shape. Um, and Shapes, um, in fact, let me move over to a shot that has, um, has a key because then we can see more clearly what's going on. So this particular layer here, layer 14, um, has a mat which is composed, uh, which is uh, being created with a hue angle key. Now at the moment, um, it's just showing the mat, but if I want to view the mat as an overlay on the image, I can change the, the rendering mode, the cursor rendering mode, to layer mat overlay. And now we can see that matte overlaid in a color on top of the image. Um, now I can change the color by clicking on this. This, If I right click on this here, I can choose, say, red, for example. 
that's now giving us a red overlay. And we can also change it from an opaque overlay to a, to a transparent overlay, so we can see the image through it a little bit. Um, and the third option is the layer matte invert overlay. And what that option is doing, it's a, a little bit difficult to tell, but what it's doing is it's showing us the parts of the image which are being affected by the key. Um, in fact, if I move up to um, this key here, it's maybe a bit clearer. Um, so if I just go back to the um, row cursor, that's showing us the output of layer seven. But if I show us, if I show the layer mat, you'll see that that key is obviously pulled off the red colors um, uh, of the felt here. And if I go to the layer mat invert overlay, it's basically just showing us the part of the image which is being affected by the mat. The rest of the image is just being shown in a mid gray color. Um, now there are keyboard shortcuts, so I don't need to keep coming in here and changing this menu. Um, to toggle on and off the matte mode, I can just simply use O on the keyboard, and that's basically going to toggle between just the layer output and the matte itself. And if I hold down Shift when I press O, it'll cycle through those different matte modes. In fact, if I change that back to a green color, it'll be clearer. So you can see that's the overlay, the matte overlay mode. That's the invert overlay mode, and that's just the matte mode on its own. And if I then let go of Shift and press O again, it'll toggle back to just showing us the layer output. And if you're working on a Blackboard or a Slate control panel, there are dedicated buttons which allow you to directly select um, the, the rendering uh, mode that you want for the cursor. Um, now there was one other option here which I skipped over, uh, which is the selection output. And if I move the cursor right back down to the bottom of the stack, um, even though the row cursor is sitting at the bottom of the stack, with the selection output mode enabled, whichever strip I click on, we will see as that's currently selected. So for example, that's the output of that key, that's the shape, and so on. Um, if I want to deselect any of these strips, I just simply click on the, the background here. Um, and the, the last option there is just the bypass all layers. Um, in other words, that's always only going to show you the top strip in the stack, in other words, the input. Um, and the key, that's the same as the keyboard shortcut F11. Okay, I'll just set that back to the uh, two row cursor, which is the default setting. Okay, the, the next option here, um, as its name implies, um, allows you to bypass specific categories. Um, now, this again, this applies to this particular cursor. So if I always wanted to bypass certain categories whenever this cursor was being used, um, I could turn them on in this uh, selection here. And we'll come back to the use of categories um, again in another tutorial. The next option, view channel. Um, as it says here, um, at the moment we're viewing RGB, but if we just wanted to view one of the red, green, or blue channels, we can choose these options here, or the Luma. Um, and these are tied to keyboard shortcuts, Shift, F1, F2, F3, F4, and F5. Now, the layer number um, I've already explained, um, and you can see that currently that is uh, grayed out. Um, but we'll see why that is in a second when we look at the next option, which is strip selection. Now, at the moment, strip auto select is on, which is why when I move the row cursor up and down, wherever the cursor sits, it automatically selects the strip. And as I move the cursor along the timeline, it's automatically selecting the strip. Um, now, if I didn't want that to happen, I can turn strip auto select off. And now you'll see that the parameters view is empty and it will only show me something when I click on a specific strip to select it explicitly. Now in that mode obviously when the cursor moves along the timeline the parameters will just stay fixed because I have to manually select another strip um, to choose the parameters. Now if I go back to the strip auto select on mode um, you'll notice that with layer 2 selected here as I move along the timeline it's always selecting layer two, 
and you'll notice here that the layer number in this field here is no longer grey, it's now white, um, implying that that is our selected auto-select uh, auto layer number. Now what happens if a layer doesn't exist? Um, for example, if I go along here, um, layer 23 in this particular stack doesn't exist in any other stack, so you'll see what it does is it finds the next highest layer, in this case it's layer 22, um, now it does exist in this one, it's called lens correction, this one it doesn't exist, so it's I'm going to layer 22. Um, so it'll always try and find the layer number if there's a matching layer number, uh, which is very handy if you've standardized the layers in your stack, for example, um, maybe a layer 1 is your base grade and you want it to just go along the same always setting the same controls. You can see that's always choosing the base grade controls for each shot. Um, now if you don't want that to happen you can say deselect on stack change and now when I move from this shot to the next one it's actually removed that selection, it's gone back to the grey auto select mode which is by default where the row is, the row cursor is sitting, so in this case it's the bottom of the stack. Um, and there's one final option here which is preferred layer number. Now if, um, for example, there's a layer that you want to work on at the moment and you want base light to always choose that layer, um, we could say, for example, say we're working on the boost shadows um, and that happens to be layer 3, then we could say we want the preferred layer to be 3. Now in this particular shot I might be working on the base grade, uh, but then when I move to the next one because we've got our preferred layer set to number three, it goes back to selecting boost shadows. And again, this is a, a, a quick way of making sure that while you're working on a specific part of your grade, um, you can very quickly select that same part of the grade in every shot as you move along the timeline. Um, now, because uh, this sort of overrides what you might have thought is happening, for example, if you thought you'd selected the base grade and you move to the next shot, and suddenly it goes to boost shadows, uh, which is layer 3, um, we have the option of showing an indicator in the display. If I go back up to the counters, and one of the counters here is to use the preferred layer indicator, and the indicator color is set to currently set to green, um, if I move along the shot here you can see that whenever I'm on a preferred layer, the preferred layer indicator comes on, but if I choose another layer it goes off. So whenever we've got a uh, layer 3, um, this one obviously isn't layer 3, no this one's layer 2, uh, but whenever I'm on our preferred layer we get an indicator in the, uh, in the, um, in the display. Um, only when you've got show counters and the preferred layer indicator enabled. Anyway, I'm going to turn that off for now and we're going to set this back to the default which is strip auto select on. Now now the default strip selection um, is set in the base light preferences in the timeline section and um, the factory default uh, would be to have the auto select mode uh, on by default but you can change that if you'd rather work with preferred layer number uh, so that's the default setting there. Okay the very last setting here um, is called panorama and we're not going to cover that at all because that only that's only really uh, relevant when you're working with a format which has a panoramic mapping and that will allow you to apply a spherical projection to 360 degree panoramic material to allow you to view it uh, within our flat image display. Okay so we covered um, quite a lot there. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned is how we actually save all those settings um, so I'll just cover that now. Um, uh, if I just scroll back up to the top here um, just to remind you that all these settings that we made uh, were for specifically for cursor number one but we can apply them um, to any cursor um, in this scene and in fact uh, if I click on the actions button here we've got two options here we can say use these cursor settings uh, when this scene is opened so anytime this scene is opened um, if we enable if I click on this button here 
These settings have now been saved so that whenever Baselight opens this specific scene, it'll always use these settings. Um, and that's quite handy because you may have set up a specific viewing color space for the monitor that you're using um, or various other settings. Um, now, if you want to work on another scene, but it's in the same job and you also want the same cursor settings, then the second option here um, allows you to use these cursor settings when you open uh, any scene in this job. So when scenes in, any scenes in this job are opened, um, it'll also apply these cursor settings. Now you can, if you decide that's not how you want to work, you can clear each of those options uh, using these buttons here. <clears throat> okay, now one other thing um, I wanted to show you, because um, I noticed that nobody's actually asked any questions, which either means you've all fallen asleep <laughs> um, or I've covered everything perfectly and you understand it all. Um, however, there is a, a little trick. Um, now, for those of you who've used, um, used Baselight a bit um, and you use the auto uh, uh, strip select mode, you may have uh, sometimes found it's a bit frustrating when you're working on a shape. Um, for example, if I, uh, if I just um, use this shape here as an example, and if, uh, for example, say I'm adjusting this shape, and let me just check, I have got auto strip, yes, yeah, strip auto select is on, which is the default mode. Um, as soon as the cursor comes out of the end of this strip, um, I've lost the shape. Now, when I go back into that, because it's auto selecting the layer and rather than the strip, um, I now have to select the shape again to go back and adjust it. And um, if you're certainly if you're working on a, a shape with keyframes or maybe a, a key, it's very annoying to have to keep doing this. Um, so a little tip is rather than dragging the cursor along the timeline, you can use the cursor in the keyframe navigation bar up here. Now, that does not allow you to drag it beyond the end of the current shot. Um, so you right. run the risk of going into the next shot and having it auto select a different strip. So when you come back, it's no longer on the shape. Anyway, I hope that's been useful. Um, as I said, um, we will have another session at a later date covering uh, use of multiple cursors and some of the more advanced options that exist uh, in the cursor settings. Um, so thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time. Thank you.